It's your piano teacher, Tim, here once again, and today I'm gonna give you a piano practice routine that's gonna make sure you cover all the important things you need to become the best piano player that you can be. Let's get on to number one. Okay, the first thing that you should have a part of your piano practice routine is a warm up. Now, what should you be doing for your warm up? Well, let me show you at the piano. Okay, so a lot of people do know about this one, which is scales. These are really helpful for developing uh, two hand coordination, the very basic coordination you need. Um, you know, simple finger crosses, things like that. It's also really good at getting you accustomed to playing in different keys. And by the time you learn all of your scales, you'll know all of your keys, at least hopefully. Now, let me go, I haven't done this in a previous lesson. Let me go into a little bit more detail on um, how you should learn your scales. So you should first start by learning all of your major scales, just one octave, just going up from one note to the next, that same note and back down, just to make sure you got that simple finger cross. And then what you wanna do is you wanna do two octaves, right? Once you learn them all at one octave, by the way. And then guess what? Once you're able to play them in two octaves, you're gonna then go through all of them and play them in three octaves. And then eventually you wanna work your way up to four octaves. Like so. And if you want an extra, actually I recommend you do this too. So once you're able to do it four octaves, at really any speed, it can be really nice and slow. Once, you, <laughs> sorry, my cable here choked me for a second. You eventually want to start practicing them with the metronome, uh, starting at a slow tempo. Once you can do it at that tempo, bump it up a little bit. Once you can do it at that tempo, bump it up. So your first and foremost thing you want to focus on is getting the right notes, getting the right finger crosses, and then getting them up to speed is actually secondary to literally everything else. And that's where I recommend you do the scales. There is an awesome, let me grab this over here on the shelf. There's actually a nice scales and arpeggios book that I am going to link you in the description. So if you're wondering like what all the sharps and flats are for each key, this will train you um, by the time you go through the whole book, you will understand everything. By the way, that brings us on to the second thing you should be practicing in your warm up, which is arpeggios. And hey, guess what? This book covers arpeggios as well. So that's got that covered. Let me just quickly explain. Arpeggio is instead of playing like a, a chord as a block all at once, you're just playing the notes separately. And usually it spans over mul multiple octaves. And you want to be practicing these obviously because these show up in your music all the time. Once again, start out with just one octave and then do two octaves and then three octaves, four octaves. I don't think I have to play the whole thing for you. And then once you get the notes down, remember notes in uh, finger accuracy first, getting the right fingers on the right notes with the right pivots and everything. Then speed, remember, is secondary. So once you go through all of them, you can play them at a slow speed, but accurately, then you want to be using this bad boy, the metronome, to get it up to speed. And if you want to know how to use the metronome to get these up to speed, I actually have lessons. I'll link you in the description on how to do that. Um, so I definitely have that lesson out there for you. No need to cover it again today, um, right now. Next. Okay, so you got scales, you got arpeggios. Next, you have etudes. Uh, what is an etude? You probably heard that word before. Well, all an etude is, is a practice piece that is designed to help you practice a certain thing on the piano. It might be like the distance between two fingers, like training one part of your hand. It might be playing in different key signatures. It might be adding a bunch of ideas all together. And let me show you some etudes because sometimes the piece will say etude in the title, but sometimes it doesn't. So let's take a look. Okay, one of the simplest, most like the first type of etude I recommend you pr 
practice is really just a simple exercise or a collection of exercises called Hannon. Now, Hannon-Online.com, you can see the link or the uh, address right there. Um, I've talked about these before on the channel, but these are really the first quote-unquote etudes that you should start. These are just little practice, practice examples, and each one of these is designed to help you practice a certain part of your hand. And you wanna go through all of these, learning them all like in the key of C first. But as you can see, once you learn them all in the key of C, you can really pick any key that you want. You know, I would actually do G after C and then learn them in the key of G. Whoops. Just like that, you gotta be careful then of your scale notes. This will also reinforce um, the advantages you get from the scales learning where the sharps or flats are for each key and also developing the certain parts of your finger. So this is the most basic form of etude. Some may not even call this an etude, but I really think that any practice piece uh, designed to help you learn something is an etude. Like I said, not all of them have etude at the top, but some of them do. Uh, for instance, there's a collection of Chopin etudes you might wanna look up if you're a little bit more of an advanced player, you've been playing this type of stuff for a while. Now let me show you another uh, collection of etudes. It's quite the collection. This pianoexercises.org, by um, this is the Cherney section. So Carl Cherney has written a ton of etudes and like studies and things in passage playing. As you can see, I'm reading these. Uh, so, so a study is basically the same as an etude. It's just a certain piece that's designed to help you learn something specific on the piano. And you can actually go through all of these, uh, a collection of etudes, as you can see, it's uh, reinforcing what I'm saying here. 100 progressive etudes, they get more and more complicated as you go along. You might wanna start with this one. Let's scroll and take a look. Let me give you a good starting place. Yes, this is what I remember. So start with the 100 progressive etudes. And what's cool about this collection is that it starts out really easy. And as you go further and further and further along, they get more and more complicated, as you can see, even just by number six here. Oops, sorry. Just like that. Um, and, and they actually sound like pretty much real pieces. They sound a little bit rudimentary, but like I said, each one is designed to help you practice something specific on the piano. For instance, number eight here, you have two treble clefs at the same time, which is something a lot of students struggle with. So if you've been practicing your etudes with two treble clefs, when you come across an actual piece, which you will, like Beethoven sonatas have this a lot, where you'll be playing bass clef, treble clef, and then all of a sudden you got two treble clefs going on. Well, you've been playing your etudes, you'll be well prepared for that. So practice your etudes. The Hannon and Cherney ones are where I want you to start. You know, uh, Bach has a, like a large collection of etudes. They're called Bach Inventions or even Bach Preludes and Fugues. You might wanna check those out. Carrie's gonna put all the words here on the screen for you so you remember where to go. And then if you're a more advanced, I recommend you check out Chopin etudes if you've been playing for quite a while. All right, let's get on to the next thing you should be in your, we're still in the warm up. Okay, I lied, that was the end of the warm up section. So then the next thing you should be practice, part of your practice routine right after you warm up is sight reading. And the reason I want you to do this right after you do the warm ups is so you don't forget about it. Let me show you at the piano what sight reading is all about. So what is sight reading? Sight reading is reading a piece of music that you've never seen before and being able to play through it beginning to end with as few mistakes as possible. And the whole key of sight reading and why we do it is the better of a sight reader you are, the faster you'll be able to learn new pieces because say I'm used to sight reading at this level, well, when I learn a new piece, the, the notes will just kind of fall under my fingers a bit better just because I'm used to reading new things more and more often. So you kind of think about if you're like learning to read, right? And you read the same thing over time. What happens 
like after you've read through it a few times your memory kicks in right and you're just purely using your memory from that point on you're not really engaging your brain in learning new material and that's why why we have sight reading so you can think about it if you're learning to read you know english or another language you start out by learning um you know a few passages but you do want to be reading new and new stuff all the time so that you are used to learning new stuff make sense so that's the whole key of sight reading ideally whatever you're sight reading should be a little bit below your current playing level like like whatever piece you're performing the sight reading you're doing should be easier than that so if i'm performing pieces that look like you know look like this lots of black ink on the page or a little bit more anyway something like this is probably where you want to be sight reading it shouldn't be as tough but it should be it should be challenging enough to read through the first time uh, you also when you're sight reading speed isn't as important i really really shoot for accuracy both in terms of the notes and the rhythms so let me show you some e the, some sight reading resources because you're probably curious and if you're not i'm going to show you anyway <laughs> okay so this is a sight reading book you can actually find this um, on amazon it's by paul harris there are eight levels total so it's really great you can start with level one work your way up all the way through these levels um, they're fairly short books but they actually explain uh, about sight reading they give you a little bit of context and then they have you sight read um, through some nice examples here. So they're actually a specific book series devoted to sight reading. And I recommend you start with this one. Now there's obviously other ways to sight read. For instance, if you have an old lesson book laying around that you've never played through before, and it's a in the pieces you find are easier than what you're currently working on, well, guess what? That's a good sight reading book. It doesn't have to be a sight reading book. It just has to be stuff you haven't seen before. So you can be playing new things that are fresh and rather than relying on your memory so much. Also, you want to start um, sight reading basically in the key of C, no sharps, no flats, and then work your way up, you know, start sight reading things in one sharp, then two sharps. That's why um, a book series like this is great because they introduce things from easiest to hardest, which is what you'll want. All right, moving right along, Church Hymnals is another great one. Um, there's actually a website called thehymnary.org, but you can, I mean, most churches will give you a hymnal or let you borrow one um, if you happen to go to church, but not all of us do, of course. So that's why there's thehymnary.org. So whether you're religious or not, it doesn't matter because um, church hymnals are really good sight reading once you've I don't recommend you start with these though Once you've been sight reading for a while then try some of these Okay, so this is an example of a church hymnal and the great thing about it is that They use very very standard chord progressions and voice leading which just means that like the chord patterns you see here Oops There you will start you will see throughout the pieces of music that you play particularly if the music isn't from the common era or from the modern era it's more from the classical and before that um and so you it teaches you good chord patterns good voice leading and it also gets you playing um pieces that are more designed for like um vocal so somebody would obviously sing the hymn over your playing and if you want to be a good pianist and you like want to do it professionally you definitely want to be able to play pieces like this that are more for a choir that's the word i was thinking of um, because you're gonna have to do that that's like one of the jobs the piano players have to do i remember when i was doing uh, music school um, every semester we had to team up this was such a pain we had to team up with a vocal artist or a vocal major and we had to play pieces for them while they sang it and we got no credit and there it was like all the what i mean like is we got we didn't get paid sometimes we get paid if the if the person had money but anyway it was a pain and it's something that you're gonna have to do i don't want to get in the whole story it's something that you're gonna have to do 
um, if you want to learn to play piano seriously. But even beside that, just learning your church hymnals and sight reading them will get you um, accustomed to playing very common chord patterns as well. All right, let's continue. Music theory is something that you should be practicing every time you practice. How do you practice music theory anyway? Well, to practice music theory, you have to learn music theory, right? And this is a great resource I have for you. I even have like a, a mini series here on the channel for this book, Alfred's Essentials of Music Theory. Again, teaches you music theory from the very beginning to uh, slightly advanced. I wouldn't say that you get into super advanced stuff by the end of this, this collection um, here, but it will get you learning a lot of the music theory you need to become successful at piano. So I definitely recommend getting a book like this. But if you don't have access to a book like this, um, there's a lot of resources online. I have a music theory course here on the YouTube channel for free. You can find it if you look around at my playlists. Um, but I also have paid music courses over on my website, Piano Lessons on the web.com. Uh, you can use code YouTube during checkout for an additional 15% off, by the way. But I have three music courses over there. And then I also have a couple composition courses, um, a lot of stuff to get you really into learning, like I said earlier, all the music theory you need to be a well-rounded piano player. You don't need to know all the music theory, but you do need to know a good solid foundation of it. So check out these resources and let's get on to the next point. The next point, let me show you at the piano. So you're probably wondering, okay, Tim, I'm learning music theory. How do you practice music theory, right? We're gonna grab this book for the fourth time today. So here's how you practice music theory. You pick a piece of music. You can be working on it. It can be something, it can even be sight reading that you've never seen before. And you wanna start applying the theory knowledge that you've been learning to the piece that you're looking at. So. You know, I'm looking for things. Let's see if we can get a good angle here. <laughs> here we go. Things like key signature. What key am I in? What time signature am I in? You know, uh, what is like the core, the, the bass pattern? What are the, what's the chord progression? Maybe if I can pick that out. So you wanna basically take like what you've been learning recently in theory, open up one of your piano books to uh, either a piece of music you've seen before or not seen before and then pick out those things. And that's how you practice music theory is by actually thinking about what you're learning and then applying it. And you should be doing that at least once while you practice. You only have to spend maybe 10 minutes on it, five, 10 minutes, um, nothing, not a big deal. All right, on to the next one, which is the meat of your practice routine. Okay, got another lesson book for you. And that's because one of the biggest things that you should be practicing is a piano piece, of course, but there's a little bit more to it than that. So if you're just starting out, I highly recommend you get like one of these book series. I actually recommend you get this one. Hold on. Anyway, <laughs> let's continue. It's about Brendan. Sh I actually recommend you check out this adult all-in-one course if you're a beginner. It includes basically um, like three levels of books in one book. It even includes a little bit of music theory and it's a great way to get started. I have a course here on YouTube where I go over most of this book. Some people are wishing that I would finish it, but I'm, uh, I'm on the fence about it. I'm thinking about it. I might finish it, I might not. But either way, pick up this book. Uh, obviously, link is in the description. It's a great resource to get you started. And let me get on to my whole point, which is you should be learning a piano piece, but not just one piano piece. How many piano pieces? The answer, will surprise you, two piano pieces at least. If you're a beginner, just start with two. You wanna be learning one piece, so say I'm here in the book, you wanna be learning one piece that challenges you a little bit. It shouldn't be impossible to play, but it should have something new in it that you haven't seen before. You ideally wanna be objective with each piece and make sure that each piece is introducing you to something new, which is another great reason you want a lesson book or you wanna take some piano courses over on my website, pianolessonsontheweb.com. Code YouTube for 15% off, of course, but you don't have to, or you could use both. I get that question a lot. Tim, uh, the lesson book, do I need your courses? Or I have your courses, do I need the lesson book? Both, you, you could definitely use both um, to supplement each other and complement each other and so forth. So one, piece that challenges you and teaches you something new 
And this one, a lot of people forget about, and you, a lot of teachers, or well, not a lot, but some teachers might not even agree that this is necessary. But I also recommend you have one piece that you like to play that isn't as hard. It's like something, maybe it's the reason you started playing piano in the first place. But it should be something that you can get through um, without much trouble, something to cleanse the palate. Because if we're learning all this new stuff, if you're doing sight reading, and you're doing you know, uh, music theory, and you're doing all this stuff, you may feel a little bit overwhelmed after a while. So you want a good, we're gonna call it a palate cleanser piece. Include, so learning piece and a palate cleanser piece is what you'll want. Make sure, do not forget about the palate cleanser. A lot of people, over time will forget that they're supposed to enjoy playing piano. Some people may not even agree you're supposed to enjoy it, but I've always held that belief because if you're enjoying what you're doing, at least to some degree, you're much more likely to stick with it in the long run. I got more for you, let's take a look. Okay, ideally, there's actually only one more point here, but I'm actually gonna add in another point. I just the thought of it, and it's something that you definitely should be practicing. This one you should only be practicing though after you've been playing piano for a few months, maybe even a few years, right? And that is ear training. That is training your ears to hear the difference between major chords, minor chords, diminished chords, augmented chords, and the difference between different chords, different patterns in your music, because it just gives your brain more information to go on when you're learning a piece. Say you're learning a piece and you know that's supposed to be in major, but you're hearing a lot of that. Well, if you train your ears, you know that you're making a mistake and you can kind of, it's just something you can double check your work on. I highly recommend you start out by learning the differences between those chords, major, minor, augmented and diminished, but then you want to branch out into intervals and uh, yeah, and then start with those two things and I think that will get you on track. I do have a course on um, ear training over on my website, pianolessonsontheweb.com once again. But I also recommend, like say um, you're looking for a free resource, I have free lessons here on the YouTube channel about ear training where we go over those four chords I mentioned. Just a little, little bit to get you started, but the course will certainly take you further. So let's continue on to uh, the last but f really important point, which is what is the final thing that you should be practicing? And you don't have necessarily have to do this last, but I do recommend e whether you are a p professional piano player, whether you're playing in recitals or not, or playing for other people or not, memory should be a part of your regular piano practice. So say I'm learning out of this book, right? And say I'm here in this book. This is the newest piece that I'm working on. Well, you know, every once in a while, what you should do is you should scroll back and look through the pieces that you've been learning diligently and say, I really love Swan Lake, right? I was able to learn it fairly easy. It was enjoyable. Um, and it just really, like maybe my grandmother, uh, it's, it, you know, it's related to somebody that you know, and it's, it's, you know, part of your heart and your mind, well, why not memorize it, <laughs> right? So uh, one part of um, any practice routine should be memory, learning, uh, not only learning new stuff, but going through some old stuff every once in a while and memorizing it and, um, and even getting it to like performance ready. Um, but you'd be surprised that by memorizing pieces, this is the most important thing, not only is it good for your brain, obviously, but it will allow you to focus better on the smaller details of the piece. So for instance, if I'm learning this piece right away, I'm, you don't even need to see a close up of it, but <laughs> you're focusing on what? Notes and rhythms and all the stuff on the page. But if you have all the stuff on the page memorized, you can focus on the finer details of the music, like phrasing, dynamics, and so memorizing a piece actually is very instrumental in getting it like performance ready or really getting it to that next level, getting that extra final layer of polish on it. Memory is super important, and guess what? As you memorize more pieces, <laughs> the better at it you'll, you're gonna get. So I have one final point here for you before we conclude, and that is, is to watch this collection of lessons right here. I hand-selected these lessons to watch after this lesson because it provides more context 
and all the things I talked about today. There's going to be a lesson about scales. There's going to be a lesson about sight reading. There's going to be a lesson about ear training and all the cool stuff that I talked about that you got to know. So if you're if you're like Tim, I really want to know more. That's where you should go. So it's been your piano teacher Tim here. Thank you so much for coming by. And I'm going to see you. Yes, you. In the next lesson. Have a great day. Yeah.